Please use the Q&A uh, Q box. Um, select all panelists uh, to ask your questions and we we'll encourage the panelists to answer the questions in real time. And we'll discuss all questions um, that are outstanding at the end of all the presentations. So today's webinar will feature updates on policy and practice adaptations from Sierra Leone and Zambia. Next slide, please. So our panelists and agenda is as follows. Um, we'll have first as um, Sierra Leone sharing their experiences with COVID um, adaptations. Um, the first presentation will be from the Minister of Health, which will be delivered by Dr. Aaron Bundy. She will discuss the policy adaptations um, for the country. And then this will be followed by Dr. John Stevens in Bethe, a medical officer from AIDS Healthcare Foundation, AHF. Um, he will discuss um, approaches that um, they implemented to increase um, ART access through community uh, refills. And then following that, we'll hear from Mr. Idris Asongo, who is the Executive Director of Natives Sierra Leone, to share the recipients of care perspective from Sierra Leone. After the Sierra Leone presentation, we'll hear from Zambia. Um, the Zambia presentation will start with Dr. Pisla Lenga, who is a technical advisor to the ART program and also the DSD focal person. And she will share the policy and practice adaptations uh, from the Ministry of Health perspective. For, this will be followed by Dr. Kozia Ziambo's presentation focusing on health facility adaptations to ensure that providers and health providers and recipients of care are protected whilst ensuring access to ART during COVID. And then finally, we we'll hear from Mr. Fred Chulgu, Executive Director of the Network of Zambia People Living with HIV and AIDS, who will share with us the recipients of care perspective. Next slide. So without much ado, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Aaron Vandy, the National Area to Coordinator and also the DSD focal person for Sierra Leone to start the presentation. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Dr. Arian Vandi from Sierra Leone, and today I will be discussing um, about DSD practice adaptations um, during COVID-19. Next slide, please. So my presentation um, overview is as follows. I will start with um, the burden of COVID-19 in Sierra Leone followed by what the priority DSD implementation measures are in Sierra Leone and what we've been doing so far with regards to COVID-19, the best practices, challenges, and some priority questions. Next slide, please. So, Sierra Leone um, was one of the last countries to actually report uh, coronavirus um, cases in Africa. But however, um, it's been very alarming the way the cases have been increasing. Um, in about six weeks, we've had more than 300 cases and the case fatality rates of 5.9%. Um, majority of those cases are the young, the um, than the old. I think this is common in Africa as we have a youthful population. However, people uh, more than 60 years have a higher um, case fatality rate as shown in the um, graphs on the slides. Uh, Lauren, next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please?
Sierra Leone has not officially launched the DSD program. However, um, due to coronavirus, we have fast-tracked implementation of DSD and with a bit of change to the eligibility criteria for all the models. Um, initially, we did have some um, unofficial implementation going on in the community, but we had we were in the planning stages for nationwide implementation. So due to coronavirus, we decided to fast track this and currently we have been doing some DSD implementation nationwide. And these are some of the um, categories we have in our system. We had um, standard categories and ones also for the special population. So we had one for the um, well recipients of care, advanced HIV diseases, stable recipients of cares, which has um, both facility and community model and unstable recipients of care. For special population, we have family-centered care, adolescents, um, pregnancy and breastfeeding women, men, and also VIP class. For the VIP working class, we already had this implemented in Sierra Leone, since we have some working class people who do not like going to the health facilities and have been receiving their um, ARV refills at their homes or their offices. But this has been scaled up and we plan to implement it also nationwide. Next slide, please. So during coronavirus uh, uh, um, pandemic, we've decided to ensure that our recipients of Claire, uh, um, care have access to their ARVs. And because of that, majority of our uh, um, clients have three MMD. So we ensure that they at least have three months refills. Um, for those who are newly initiated on ARVs, we do consider their clinical um, states and it could be ranges from one month to three months. However, um, for those who are continuing uh, uh, um, um, recipients of care, they are fast track at the facility. And for the pregnant women, children, they all receive the MMD. And for TB and HIV co-infected, we ensure to synchronize their drug refills with their anti-TB medication. So um, the TB guidelines um, for now, they have about two months refill, but we're working with them to ensure at least these are synchronized and we are on the same page to decrease the uh, um, um, the clinic uh, um, 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 and also to ensure that like our staffs are safe and reduce contacts with clients. For the community models, we also give in three MMD for all our clients. Um, we have home delivery, we have support groups, and we also have the drop-in centers for key population. So we encourage our um, recipients of care to call the service providers when they need a refill, and we ensure that like, we do the delivery at the, um, um, the place of choice. So it could be at their home or their support group or in the community. But however, for these uh, models, we are um, advocating and ensuring that like, social distancing is always practiced in order to prevent a spread of coronavirus. Next, please. So some of the best practices which we've um, identified so far. The um, recipients of care um, calling service providers for their AR3 refills, it's very good, um, especially during the lockdown when um, our clients do not have access to these health facilities. So it's easier for them to receive their refills at the community. So we have provided contact numbers for each facilities and they know where to call or who to call and they get their drugs at home or where they prefer it's been delivered. So this has been very successful, especially during the lockdowns. We've had like um, two lockdowns in the past um, month, and this has helped a, a, a lot with um, ensuring that like we still have services for ongoing in the community and also in the facilities. Currently, we are supporting the um, COVID-19 response. I am part of the case management team, just to ensure that like our recipients of care are not neglected, and also to monitor what's going on at the facilities, um, especially for those um, who are HIV positive and also uh, um, um, are positive for coronavirus. And we are doing community household um, ART distribution. This is done with support from our partners. This has been very um, useful because um, we do not have the human resource or logistic support by ourselves, but with our partners, we've been able to scale up on this, and this has helped a lot. And also, we are planning to use electronic data reporting tools for community ART distribution. ICAP is supporting us with this. Um, this is a very good um, plan because um, 
we were in the planning stages for um, implementation of DSD. So we do not have an MNA framework or uh, um, a nationwide, um, uh, uh, an official reporting tool. So having an electronic um, data reporting tool for now to ensure that we have data which will enable us to make decisions, this will be very useful for us until, and during this time, we're also working with um, TA and uh, also um, partners to ensure that like, we don't forget about implementation um, uh, of DSD. We are also focusing on what we plan initially and ensure that like, we do um, capture this at the end of the day. Next slide, please. So the challenges, I think this cuts across like every country from now where we have intermittent stock out of ARVs um, and also IPC materials. Um, so currently we've been looking at the guidelines and looking at ways how we can substitute for those ARVs which we don't have, but um, so far it's been intermittent, not complete stock out, and we are hoping that we will have um, uh, all of our ARVs delivered soon, those that we've already put in order for. But this has been, there's been some challenges with getting the drugs here because of the coronavirus. And we do have also some human resource and logistic uh, challenges for our community ART distribution and also limited data for decision making. Our priority questions are um, we would like to know what the prevalence of HIV and COVID 19 comorbidities are. Um, this is new and we want to know the, um, what's going on in the um, treatment centers. That's why we are working very closely with the response to ensure that like, we do capture some of this data. And also managing of COVID-19 positive cases living with HIV. And the effect of COVID-19 on adherence, we would like to know whether this is as improved or it is becoming worse. And also to add to that, we would like also to know if there have been like the mortality rates in um, patients who are uh, COVID-19 and living with HIV and also the length of hospital stay. Um, stay. These are some of the questions we're looking to um, research on during this um, pandemic. Next slide, please. I think this is all for me. Uh, in case you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to me by my contact number that's displayed. And I'll be checking the chat box also in case there's any more questions for me. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you very much, um, Dr. Vandy, for that interesting presentation from Sierra Leone. Clearly, COVID has helped you fast track uh, adaptation of DSD and uh, happy to follow up the progress you are making. Um, our next presentation will be from Dr. John Stevens Imbete, uh, who is a medical officer for HF Sierra Leone. Um, Dr. Imbete, please. And please, a reminder to all of you to uh, post your questions in the Q&A box. Um, the panelists will be answering them in real time. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Peter. I'm Dr. John Bette, AHF Sierra Leone. Next slide. So this is going to be the outline of my presentation. Next slide. So this is about AHF. You can see our vision, clientele we support, and the total clientele, um, the national clientele, and then our area of support um, within the um, national program. Next slide. Next slide. So um, before COVID-19, there was no um, um, documented guidelines on community drug delivery. But however, as an organization, um, on a daily basis, our clients were scheduled to pick up drugs from our facilities based on their appointments. And clients that also missed their appointment or lost to follow up are follow up in the community through phone calls or our caregivers who collect their drugs and take them to the communities for their refill. There are also clients that are not comfortable to pick up drugs from the facilities due to stigma related issues are follow up by our staffs from the communities, um, in, uh, from the facilities into the communities through home visits. So we do a lot of um, um, community outreaches and testing, especially in rural areas. We are in our staff, we go out in the communities and identify positives, and all of these positives are linked to care. 
So some of these um, clients are stay far away from the facilities we support. So what we normally do um, at the initial visits, we come to the facility, uh, we do their baseline medication um, investigations, and then they will go back into the communities. So on weekly and monthly basis, our um, staffs will go into these facilities to distribute their medications because of um, issues of transportation and stigma-related issues also. We also support the mother mentors um, in community ART care delivery to pregnant women in partnership with Voice of Women. Voice of Women is a support group um, supported by next of me, uh, people living with HIV and AIDS. Then also um, for the adolescents, we support the formation of adolescent group in partnership with Happy Kids. These adolescents we peer, um, we, we serve as peer support to their peers. Um, they help us with a linkage. Yeah, we have any um, positive plans that have been identified, and then we follow up them in their communities. But I said there was no, no data actually to support our evidence on community um, outreach refill. Next slide. Next slide. So the current practice um, during COVID-19, remember our first case of COVID-19 was um, on the was um, reported on the 31st March 2020. But before this, um, prior to this, the NSPP and partners developed emergency preparedness plans to guide um, HIV service delivery in and out of facility. So what we did was we um, form um, a community drug distribution team in all our facilities, including clinicians and non-clinicians. That is the um, CHWs and um, the counselors. So um, this team actually um, goes into the community, identify um, our clients and distribute drugs to them. So here we target both scheduled and unscheduled clients. We call them, we schedule our visits in these facilities and go there to distribute their drugs because we don't want to discongest our facilities due to COVID-19. So our staffs um, verify their phone numbers and addresses before they go into the communities. So currently we are giving the three monthly drugs to all stable clients, irrespective um, whether you have been on um, treatment for one month or two months, because we don't want these clients to be coming to the facilities as the case may be. So therefore our um, staffs go into these facilities to distribute their drugs. Except for co-infections, um, we normally encourage them to come to the facilities uh, once in a while for monitoring. So as package during this uh, service include um, adherence through phone calls, distribution of ARVs, and the basic wire medications as well as conducts. And then our staffs also collect samples, viral samples, and EID from eligible clients within the community. So as you can see, this graph is just showing you um, the pattern of distribution of the drugs of our clients. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So as I was saying, um, the graph is just showing you the pattern of distribution of our, our, uh, of our two monthly and three monthly drugs to all our facilities. So as of now, we have 80% of our facilities have drugs for either two months or three months. Next slide. Next slide. So this other graph is also showing you um, our two monthly drugs um, distribution at clinic level. Because we are not capturing um, the statistics of our community deliveries, so we therefore incorporate them in our daily reporting too. So as you can see, we have more flow of clients in March as compared to um, um, February because of the strategies that are put in place to deliver drugs for these communities. We have more patients now on treatment um, in March as compared to February. Next slide. Next slide. So these are teams of staff moving into the rural communities to distribute drugs. And these are our staffs pre-packaging the drugs before they go into the communities. Next slide. Next. 
So what were the safety measures put in place before these people go into the community? Of course, we observe all IPC protocols. We encourage them to use face masks. But before they go into the communities, we make sure we engage um, the clients themselves through phone calls. And then we visit most of the PHUs. For the PHUs, these are where um, um, normally um, the CHWs and other staffs, normally clinical staffs normally go. So we synthesize them that uh, we are planning a visit to these areas. So therefore, the safety will be maintained. And we also encourage hand hygiene by using sanitizers in these communities. And then for those that are collecting um, samples, especially lab technicians, we encourage them to use the full PPE in order to avoid infections. And then social distance, of course, is maintained between clients and the caregiver. We then encourage them to have group counseling. Of course, for the counseling, we do our phone calls to counsel them. And then for areas that are hard to reach, especially during lockdowns, we we'll obtain passes for these people to go into these communities so that at least they will, um, they will not be harassed by the security partners while delivering their duties. Next slide. Next slide. So what are the implementation challenges? Of course, there is no national um, community drug delivery model. So we are only using manual tracking system of clients leading to delay in reaching some of these clients. So normally, like during lockdown, what was done, um, the NAC provided us um, a checklist wherein the clients that call, we record their phone numbers, their addresses, we go into the community. So normally, we don't target our own um, clients within our facility. We also target clients that are out of our facilities. So when you capture them on this record, we come back to NACP and give them the information so that at least they will now know that these patients that are in facility A got drugs from AHF which are not part of their support. And the wrong contact of clients is also a challenge. They have very, give a wrong phone numbers in our facilities. So therefore it's very difficult for them to reach. Stigma of course is another challenge in most of our community drugs um, deliveries. Like you remember at one time um, in Kenema, we had a call from our staffs. The clients called, when they went there, um, he was there, she was seated there, they called, she picked the phone number, she said this wrong number. So when they get back to the facilities, she has to call and say, oh, I was with my husband, that's why I did not pick up the call. So these are a few of the challenges we get from uh, the communities. Then inadequate PPEs, the inadequate PPEs. Of course, what we have done as an organization, we try as much as, as best as possible to procure some IPC materials to be distributed to the areas that we are supporting, so that at least we can augment the efforts of the national program. The limited passes to our constituents during lockdowns, that one we have no control by it because we have to apply through um, electronic um, applications. So they will only limit you to either two or one pass. Stock out of ARVs, as you heard from the ARC coordinator, that was a very big challenge during our um, community outreach activities. The ARG drugs, the second line drugs are limited in country. And fear is also a challenge to even our staffs because COVID-19 is something that um, is an emerging infection. So therefore, the knowledge of our staff are limited. So what we are doing, we are want to like um, encourage training on COVID-19 specific IPC and even psychosocial training so that our um, staff will be confident to actually deliver their services within the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. John Stevens, um, please, I want to encourage um, those who have raised their hands to please uh, either type um, their questions in the Q&A box or we are happy to take questions at the end of the presentations. So with that, I would like to encourage all our presenters to please stick to time so that we will have enough time for uh, the Q&A. Thank you. May I now invite Mr. Idris Usongo, Executive Director for Natives, Sierra Leone, to give us the ROC perspective. Three minutes, please, Dr. Idris. Mr. Idris. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Preko. I wish to thank Dr. Vandi and Dr. Bete for their brilliant presentation. I also want to thank Sequin and partners for this laudable strategy. As recipient of care in Sierra Leone, 
our experience with the 3MMD is that it has been working well with few challenges. Recipients of care have mentioned that the three months distribution they receive have saved time and finances since they no longer go to, the, to visit facilities on a monthly basis for their refill. In fact, this has been our advocacy with the national program prior to COVID-19. As we see from the presentations of both Dr. Vandy and Dr. Benton, one of the key challenges has to do with stock out, especially of second line drugs. And this is a serious concern for us. We also have fear that if we do not receive drug in country, Within this month, there is the potential of stock out of pediatric drug. Now, when we look at the cumulative um, uh, result from the Emergency Operation, Operation Center that coordinates COVID-19 response in the country, it really shows that infection among um, healthcare workers and their family is the highest. And this has actually led to serious concern from recipients of care and as a result resulted in reluctance in visiting healthcare facilities for their refills. What we have however planned to do as a country, that is all of all HIV service providers like natives, the NACP, the National Aid Secretariat, UNS, AHF, and other HIV service providers is to strengthen the community delivery system using support groups and drop-in centers of key populations where recipients of care feel safer and comfortable to go for services during this period. Another arrangement put in place is to engage in door-to-door -door delivery of ARV for recipients of care who could not make it to the facilities. Follow-up calls are made to them to remind them of their refills and actually reassure them to come to the facilities for HIV services. Now, one key lesson that we learned from the Ebola response was to work together as a team. And we've been able to use that in this response to COVID-19. All HIV partners meet virtually every Thursday from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. And this meeting is hosted by UNAIDS on behalf of the National AIDS Control Program. And the purpose is for us to plan together and feedback on implementation successes, challenges, and way forward. Despite all of this, we would like to make three recommendations. One, that the National AIDS Control Program and the TB Program work together to address issues of one-stop shop so that recipients of care that are co-infected with tuberculosis get uninterrupted supply of their TB drugs, as there is, this is a big challenge for now. We are aware of the fact that both intensive and continue, uh, continuation phase anti-TB drugs are in short supply in so many um, adult centers. Two, that due to the current economic situation in the country as a result of the COVID-19, recipients of care find it difficult to afford monies to buy their cotrim and other prophylaxis, including routine vitamins. It, it will be helpful if recipients of care get complete supply, they are, these supplies when they are going for, the, for their three MMDs. And finally, we recommend that recipients of care that are food insecure be provided with nutrition or food support to aid treatment adherence. Thank you very much for the opportunity and for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Soglo. Um, we are always happy to hear the perspective of recipients of care. Thank you. Um, our next presentation is going to be from Zambia. And uh, to kickstart the Zambia presentation will be Dr. Priscilla Bolengo, who is the ESD for Capacity. Um, Dr. Priscilla, please take over. Hello. Dr. Kusra, we can hear you. Please take over. Okay, good um, afternoon or whatever time it is, wherever you are listening uh, to us from. Uh, 
uh, I've been introduced. Um, I'm Priscilla Molenga from Zambia. Currently, I'm the uh, Differentiated Service Delivery uh, National Coordinator. I'll take you through um, the Zambian presentation on the impact of COVID-19 uh, on our differentiated service delivery. Uh, next slide. Yes, um, as a country, we are um, land linked with about um, eight, um, surrounded by eight countries. Uh, we recorded the first case of COVID-19 uh, in the capital city, Lusaka, on March uh, 18, 18th, 2020. And since then, we have had confirmed uh, cases uh, in four out of 10 provinces. Uh, the provinces are Lusaka, Central, Copper Belt, and Muchinga. So the first case was with um, history of travel from, uh, from France. Uh, it was a couple actually, a uh, resident in Zambia, but they are originally from France. Okay. So they, they were uh, for a long time until 9th May, uh, Lusaka, the capital city has been the epicenter of the epidemic. So even in the four provinces that I have highlighted here where we've had confirmed cases, there are only one or two districts. Like for Lusaka, it's two districts, Lusaka and Tafue. Uh, Central, it's only one district. Copper Belt, again, it's about uh, one district. And now we have another district in, um, in Mochinga, and Mochinga borders Tanzania. So the district that has been heavily affected as at now is uh, a district called Nakonde um, in Mochinga province. And that's where now the epicenter has shifted for the Zambian um, uh, pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, um, on the national response, I think we have had a well-coordinated national response. And this response, I should mention that it's being led uh, by the Ministry of Health and uh, with uh, Zambia National Public Health Institute, which is just like a statutory body uh, for uh, affiliated to, to Ministry of Health. And the ZNPHI is the one leading the surveillance. The clinical team is coming from the Directorate of um, Clinical Care and Diagnostics at MOH. Um, let me also mention that we have had actually active engagement of uh, the head of state. On a, uh, on a biweekly basis, the president has been like uh, addressing the nation and is the one who's been like um, issuing the, the measures that the country has to observe. So some of these measures, I've put them on the screen, of course, we do not have like a national uh, countrywide lockdown, but uh, we are, there's emphasis for us to stay home, to stay safe, and uh, there's implementation of uh, social distancing of one meter or more, uh, of course, hand washing and sanitizing, um, uh, observance, and there's what we are calling mask up operation when you're in public places and some businesses have closed, schools, churches, and uh, of course, businesses, and there's uh, avoidance of public gatherings, and uh, the guidance is that uh, only up to uh, 50 can you uh, gather but otherwise, uh, if necessary, we need to defer these public gatherings. So things like weddings, uh, even at funerals, they are not allowing you know, people to congregate. Yeah, there's been border control screening with no un uh, emphasis on no unnecessary travel to COVID-19 high-risk areas. And those coming, uh, the borders actually, the international uh, borders have not been closed, so to say. Um, uh, only that people are allowed to come into the country, but they, they are subjected to the 14-day quarantine 
uh, when, when, when coming in the country at, at, the, at their own cost, so to say. And uh, the screening, especially of the truck drivers, uh, every truck driver, they are escorted as they transit through the country and um, they are quarantined for some period uh, before they are released, 14 days. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah, so this is just showing how we have fared in terms of statistics as a country. Uh, the blue line, uh, these, these have been the confirmed cases. We have seen like starting from like 5th May, we are seeing um, cases skyrocketing. This is because of the uh, high numbers that we are reporting from Nakonde, the border town with Tanzania. And, um, uh, though the, uh, and this is where I said the epicenter has shifted to. But again, and let me emphasize that we have had um, good recoveries, okay? Uh, quite a number, the green line is showing recoveries and we've reported up to today, we've reported seven deaths. So the seven deaths, um, four out of the seven had like underlying uh, conditions. Uh, the only deaths we would say were purely due to COVID um, are three, with four having uh, some uh, critical underlying conditions. But we are reporting all the deaths as long as someone had, um, had the infection tested positive. Next slide. And next slide. Yeah, so this is just what I've already presented. So I should make mention that out of the cumulative cases, this was as on 10th May, 2020, but today they've just announced that uh, in Nakonde, the same border town uh, with uh, Tanzania, it has reported 174 cases. So when you add uh, cumulatively, the cases have increased to 441, okay? The dates are still uh, seven, and the active cases, uh, uh, you, you add what has been reported today. Okay. Next slide. Um, uh, as a DSD National Task Force, we have uh, not really made uh, changes specifically to the COVID-19 situation. What we have done instead is just to enhance the guidance that was already in existence, even before uh, the COVID. Uh, sometime last year, we had issued a memo uh, to say that um, we could do six month, multi month scripting and dispensation. Before that, the, the, high, uh, the maximum number of months that we could dispense was three months. Uh, though the prescription would say six months, the dispensation was only limited up to six months. So from last year, we issued that memo, uh, working with the HIV coordinator uh, to move towards six month, multi month scripting and dispensation. So during this period, what we have done is just reinforce that. And I'm happy to report that actually adherence to this has been uh, very good. A lot of uh, recipients of care, those that are stable, are actually opting um, uh, for this. Uh, so we have seen some shift from other models to the six-month, uh, multi-month uh, scripting. And also in some areas, they are reporting disintegration of the cards in preference uh, because members are preferring to switch to the six-month multi month scripting and dispensation. Okay. Uh, what I would also want to report on is that uh, during this period, we have actually um, introduced um, a DSD models, uh, three month multi month scripting and dispensation for children above two years. I should also make mention that this was something that was already in process. It has just happened that we have finished and we are implementing it now. Uh, for DSD for children. Uh, one of the things that I can mention 
uh, as a as as a challenge but meshing it now is that uh, we used, we were transitioning as our first line uh, drug regimen especially for adults uh, from TLE uh, to TLD but because uh, of the concerns of shipment uh, with the TLD with all the lockdowns uh, that are um, that are there we have halted the transition of TOD, the transition to TOD, because we were concerned of the stock. Instead, uh, we are only initiating uh, new patients on TOD. Those that are already on um, uh, uh, TOE, we are maintaining them for now uh, on, on, on TLE. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Yeah, in terms of uh, community level and facility level practices, okay, the detail, my colleague, Dr. Kozia is going to, to elaborate on that. Otherwise, the TPT dispensation is now being aligned to ARV refill after prior education and the follow-up has been through phone calls where possible and also on the early adherence uh, counseling sessions uh, they've reduced in frequency and duration, and also phone consultation are being made. Uh, we have not made uh, changes to pregnant and breastfeeding women. It has continued as usual. Then the teen clubs, um, they've continued, but reduced duration and numbers. And concerning uh, community meetings for CAGS, um, no explicit changes as long as um, they are able to observe the guidance that has been uh, given. If they are able to observe one meter social distancing, it's fun and the, the meetings are going on. Next slide. Okay. So Dr. Preko, I'm done. I just want to say that um, uh, our Victoria Force, it's now at its peak. So this was going to be a good time for people to visit our Victoria Force. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Molenga. Um, we'll find time to visit. Um, may we now receive our next presentation from Dr. Kozia Ziambo. So good you have five minutes, please. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and good morning to my dear colleagues on the network. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to share some experiences from Material Level One Hospital in Osaka province. Um, so my name is Kozia Ziambo. I'm a pediatrician, a pediatric clinical mentor in the HIV program. And so uh, material has a catchment area of 471,000 uh, population. It's in a high density suburb and uh, has a TX car of about 13,000 uh, uh, people living with HIV on uh, treatment. Then um, I usually sees uh, on an ordinary day about 120 people per day uh, before the outbreak. But soon after the outbreak was declared, because we wanted to quickly decongest the, the, the clinics, we called in some people to come and pick up six months, uh, month, month dispensation as guided uh, by the national program. So as at now, we see about 75 uh, per day. These are given appointments and uh, a lot of adjustments uh, have been made in the clinics. So at this particular facility, uh, we only practice multi mass dispensation, fast track and health post model. So these are all facility-based models. We do not have any community models at this facility. Next slide. So regarding the fast track services, uh, we, we, we did manage to enhance the fast track uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the quickness in which we saw the patients. So what we did was that this, we, the screening rooms were increased and uh, the drug pickup points were increased. Then we reduced the waiting time and time spent in the facility as a result of that. So also uh, the group 
uh, information and education uh, meetings were, have also been reduced and so not much we don't spend much time doing that and also there's strict adherence to appointments by date and time so we've tried to make sure that I've got uh, time appointments in a day then uh, we also have a, a patient labeling of patient sitting has been labeled and um, all patients uh, required to wear face mask hand washing points have increased triage points also have been set up to just make sure that uh, all those that are being uh, coming into the facility have been screened negative uh, for symptoms of covid and there's been strict adherence and availability of ppes uh, so this is still remains as a challenge. Not everyone has been able to access uh, personal protective equipment, but uh, we do ensure that uh, some, at least most people are having it. And uh, staff have been trained uh, in triage points in infection prevention measures. Next slide. Uh, when it comes to multi-mass dispensation, uh, as given by the national guidance, uh, so we did actually uh, call back some of our clients to receive the six-mass dispensation uh, so that they don't reduce the frequency. Uh, however, some of our clients that were failing treatment and receiving enhanced uh, endurance counseling, uh, were, they were provided with three months supply with the phone uh, phone calls being made where possible. And then clients with comorbid conditions such as diabetes, uh, tuberculosis, we try and align the prescriptions to their multi-month of ART. And uh, also uh, clinicians are consulted regarding the comorbid condition before that can be done. And then so all stable and the uh, clients eligible for six months were recorded and given. Then also we initiated people on ad and put on TLD, though this has been halted due to the anticipated uh, disruption in supply chain. So we have enough stock of the tenofovir, lamivudine, and epicoverance, which we were actually using to give uh, recipients of care. And then children, we had to come up uh, quickly with something that would accommodate and reduce the number of frequency of children coming to the hospital. So we're giving three multi months dispensation of ARVs with, adher with adherence counseling of caregivers. Then adolescents, uh, we've, con we've also enhanced a six months dispensation where appropriate, with appropriate counseling. Next slide. Uh, this is my last slide. So, Dr. Preko, I'm trying to be in time. Um, further updates is that uh, we anticipated disruption, and so um, we've halted the TLD, and uh, we're giving TLE, and uh, also we've increased frequency of ordering of drugs from monthly to weekly to catch up with the demand for D, uh, MMD, and then also the number of recipient of care supplied with six months to date so far is at uh, 580. 8,000. Uh, so this is, um, so 5,088, oh, 5,881 clients on the uh, current uh, have been given multi month uh, dispensation. So this is what is happening at uh, material level one hospital. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Zambo, for keeping time and sharing a nice presentation. Um, we'll take our last presentation from Mr. Fred Trungu, um, who is Executive Director of uh, Network of Zambian People Living with HIV. He will share with us uh, responses from the experience of care community. Mr. Trungu, Good please. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Good uh, afternoon, we can hear you. Thanks very much, Doc. And good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Afred Chungu, uh, representing the network of Zambian people living with HIV and AIDS. I'm uh, giving reflections on behalf of the recipients of care as a community. So in terms of uh, the new policies and how they are working or not working, 
Uh, previously, Zambia never had any guidelines to do with COVID, but currently the Ministry of Health is working on the uh, guidelines on HIV services amidst uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which are in draft and probably they might be finalized this week. However, uh, some time back in uh, um, March, uh, the, 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 the Permanent Secretary had uh, issued the memo uh, for, for, for recipients of care to access uh, three to six months uh, month scripting for, for stable clients. With the DSD guidelines, what we have observed is that the, well, what is working well is that the health facility based models and the MM, the mouth month scripting are working so well. Uh, while the community based models are not working in all districts, we have very few districts that are, uh, are conducting or are implementing the community based models. Uh, in terms of the experience of the recipients of, of care in collecting the six, the three to six months, uh, months scripting, uh, we are saying in most facilities, uh, recipients of care are accessing three to six months, uh, month scripting, though not all health facilities are providing the six months, but uh, dependent on the shelf life of the drugs. So as the recipients of care, we have observed less congestion at health facilities, which has made uh, people living with HIV spend less hours in, 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 in health facilities in instances when we go to collect our drugs. This has encouraged even those that are on first track to collect their drugs before going for a week. Uh, in terms of um, uh, rocks, uh, uh, recipients of care feeling protected from the COVID when we go to health facilities or community drug pickups. So each time the recipients of care uh, visit the health facilities, they are sensitized on COVID-19, especially on preventive measures. So some of the people even with HIV we talk to are taking the threat posed by COVID-19 seriously and are staying alert during this period. So as recipients of care, we feel protected because uh, we can now receive drugs which can sustain us for up to th three to six months in order for, for us to minimize the frequent, fre frequenting health facilities. But despite that, uh, despite feeling protected, there are very few community-based uh, DST models that are functional which can further reduce on the, on the congestion at health facilities. Therefore, as uh, recipients of care, when accessing treatment from these facilities, uh, despite the implementation of the fast track, there, we, still, we, still fear of con we, we still have that fear of contracting uh, coronaviruses from the health facility, as most of us do not have face masks and hand sanitizers. So are we getting what is recommended uh, even at police level? So recipients of care are getting what is recommended such as routine viral load testing and CD4 count, test, uh, CD4 count testing and uh, the provision of prophylactic drugs such as septrin. But the challenge has been the turnaround time for viral load test results, which take long, especially for those that take their samples at health facilities that do not have viral load machines. As for missing appointments, uh, we, we are saying that for as long as uh, for, for, for missing appointments, we have the laws to follow up who are missing the, the, the the appointment, this is not necessarily due to COVID-19, but because of other factors such as distance to health facilities, self-stigma, and uh, giving out wrong contacts. So most of, the, most of the facilities have made a lot of efforts to contact those that are supposed to come for refill within the next month. So this is being addressed by formation of community at access points and uh, engaging people living with HIV 
to cancel the, new, the, 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 the newly initiated on treatment. And some are dropping out, uh, missing the appointment due to resistance to receive the, the, the change drugs in case of drug stockouts. So the recommendations are that the Ministry of Health should support the recipients of care with face masks, hygiene soaps, when they visit health facilities. Uh, Ministry of Health should also support PLHIV civil societies to facilitate the formation of CAPS and conduct sensitization activities on COVID-19 pandemic. There is also need to have PLHIV placed in the health facilities to provide counseling on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Chogu. We appreciate the feedback from the community of physicians of care. So we have about two minutes. Um, I'll first of all like to thank all our panelists um, for great presentations. We have a few questions that have not yet been answered. I wonder if we have time for that. But what I want to mention is that we have um, we have compiled all the questions, and uh, those questions that will not be answered by the end of the session, we will share with the uh, presenters and link those who have the questions to the presenters so that they can be answered. Um, with that, uh, I just want to check quickly if there's a question for... So there was a, a general question. I don't know if that has been answered, but um, it's about using telephones to contact people. It looks like all the countries are doing that. And uh, we just want to know how uh, that is going because a lot of facilities do not have phones, we know. So how, how realistic is the implementation of that approach? Um, maybe if you can hear from our facility presenters. Uh, Dr. Breko, for, for, for the case of Zambia, um, it's not in every facility that you, we have the privilege of phone calling. So we have some facilities that have got strong partners that uh, have already in their usual activities, they make phone calls. And so that's what we are riding on. And so they have actually continued with those. Of course, the challenges of phone numbers, wrong phone numbers, not enough not having enough phone calls, but we try to get phone numbers even from the neighbor, even from the, the people they, they are surrounded with. So we try by all means to always have a phone number of a person uh, that is living with, uh, with HIV and uh, under our care. So those are some of the experiences for, from Zambia. It's a, it's, it's a difficult, it's a daunting task, but I think under the circumstances, we are all stretching to ensure that the service is provided under these circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. John Stevens, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, um, in addition to that, um, our experience here in Sierra Leone, um, we actually don't have issues of phone calls within our facilities because all our facilities, the schedules, and even the triage nurses are provided phones and then with top-ups on monthly basis. So, we reach out to most of our clients. The only challenge we have is the wrong phone numbers given to some of the facilities. So it's very difficult for us to reach them. And even those that we reach, especially in this um, epidemic, this pandemic, um, in certain situations, you can call a client, a client will answer, okay, we'll see you tomorrow. Maybe he or she um, have not disclosed um, the, her status, uh, the, um, the status of HIV status to the partners, so we find it very difficult to get them um, during the visit into the community. So these are a few of the challenges we have um, here in Sierra Leone with regards to phone calls. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. John Stevens. Um, you all agree with me that this has been a very interesting uh, webinar, and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Next week, we have a very another exciting package for you. Um, 
And uh, we want to invite you to join us next week on the 19th of May. It's going to be on multi-sectoral interventions to ensure uninterrupted access to ART during the COVID-19 lockdowns. Uh, as you heard, a lot of countries are implementing lockdowns and it, this is affecting access to um, antitrust therapy. So we want to discuss some of the interventions that countries have put in place to make sure that uh, people are still able to access ART in spite of the lockdowns. We'll hear from four countries, so we invite you all to join us. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our presenters and all of you for joining us. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you.